Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. This past uh, Monday, I was uh, honored to be invited to the launch of a new institute in uh, Canada, launched by Frank Stronach. And uh, Frank Stronach is a, a Canadian businessman that probably needs no introduction. I'll chat a little bit about his career in a minute. But first of all, I wanted to talk with him about this new institute that he's launched and what it's all about. Frank Stronach, welcome to our show. Oh, good to be with you. So tell me about this institute that you've launched, please. Well, basically, um, I've always said, and pretty well everybody agrees, all the politicians, all the business people, and most people agree, if the economy doesn't work, nothing else will work. You cannot feed the hungry. You cannot look after the most fragile people, the elderly, the sick, and the handicapped. And so we agree on that. But to me, it's amazing we don't talk what drives the economy. The economy is driven by three forces, smart managers, hardworking employees, and investors. What I want to bring over loud and clear is workers have a moral right to some of the profits to help generate so that's what we, that's what the, funda the foundation basically will focus on. The human charter of rights would have to be fortified with an econo economic charter of rights. Economic charters of rights will lead to economic democracies, and economic democracies are the basis for democracy itself. In essence, we could eliminate poverty. And if you eliminate poverty, you eliminate hate, you eliminate just about everything. So an economic charter of rights is what you're after. Yes. And this is uh, an institute that uh, that you've launched. Uh, um, what do you want this institute to do? To uh, to raise money? To so Basically, uh... to create a grassroots movement. Okay, it's got to, it's got to, um, it's got to be endorsed by people. Or basically, we trying to uh, arouse the interest of small businesses, because small businesses are the backbone of any country, and usually, small business, uh, all call it the new technologies, the new products, usually get started by small business. So, but small business is so tied up in, in red tape now. So um, I, I think they would appreciate it uh, that there's an organization where we, where we can agree on a few basics and, uh, and to bring about, uh, bring about change that the economy functions. You talked through, um, I think it was seven or eight different uh, issues that you wanted to be included in this economic charter of rights and maybe, after uh, a break, we'll ask you about what some of those uh, sure. main issues are. But, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that you mentioned was that uh, that employees should share in a fair portion of uh, the economic progress. Uh, and that is something that Magna was always about, uh, profit sharing. Um, tell me, where does that uh, come from, this attitude that you've had both in this economic charter of rights, but also at Magna, that that uh, employees deserve a fair share of uh, of economic progress? Well, it's an evolutionary process, right? When I started out, uh, you know, uh, back in 57, I saved about $5,000. I rented a garage and went out hustling and went to in the factories. And I said, I'm very good in solving problems. If I can't solve the problems, they don't have to pay me. So after one month, I hired somebody. After a year, about 10 people. After two years, 20 and then evolution sets in. I noticed my foreman was foreman was different. So I asked him, what's the matter with you lately? And he said, look, Frank, I'm thinking of opening up my own business. I had a full understanding of that because he was the first employee I had. So I teach them everything, how a business should be run. So anyway, I said to him, look, let's talk tomorrow. Maybe we could find another answer. That evening, I was talking to myself, and I said, if that foreman's going to leave me, that would stifle my growth. Not a good idea for me. The next reason was, if that foreman's going to leave me, I would have to do all the work. I liked it even less. And the third reason was, if I do not teach a new foreman, 
uh, our business is run, I still got to do all the work. So anyway, basically, I said to the foreman, I said, look, why don't you start a new factory? I said, you have a third, I have two thirds. We By the end of the year, we take some profits out with some relief in. And uh, he said, you mean it? And I say, yes. So we went to the lawyer right away. And uh, we drafted up an agreement. He, and he worked like crazy. That was his company. So I took the next form and the next form and the next form and the next form. And so, uh, you know, I was still a pretty young guy. I got I had a lot of money coming in. I see, gee, business is easy. But then I saw this huge, huge market out there, the global market, right? Uh, uh, so um, I came to the conclusion, I, uh, besides the foreman, I, I really should also have the employees uh, participating in the profit or get a portion of the profits. And a few years later, well, it, it, it took quite a while, you know, because I felt I should have a public company. Because if you have a private company and a worker wants to sell his shares, then um, the, the small company or company might not have the, uh, the, the money at that time. So anyway, I thought there should be a public company. When I put this corporate constitution in the, in the public company, uh, or um, when I implemented profit sharing, our profits went up the first year 40%. The second year, a hundred percent. The third year, two hundred percent. So it was an amazing thing here because when employees know they get a portion in a tangible way of the profits they generate or the products they create and have input, and thereby they they they're on the front line. They can make the product the products better cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. And if they get a portion, that's what drives the whole thing. So uh, I, I think I came to the conclusion, look, uh, all the employees in Canada should share the profits. So the secret is, number one, having management that shares in the profits. Number two, having employees share in the profits. Uh, in addition, you've, um, I think, created a, 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 a situation where a lot of the different uh, factories that you had reached a certain size and then you didn't expand it any further. You went off and started another one. And so therefore, is there something about what not small is beautiful, but maybe medium size is beautiful. Yeah. It's uh, I think when you get too large, when you have too many people in one place, people become a number and and but every employee wants to recognize be recognized that they have input and be paid accordingly to it. So I, I came to the conclusion about if you go with 200 people, the manager um, will lose track, will 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 not recognize or, or will not be able to interface with every employee. So I left, um, I left it um, just uh, with about factories, about 200 employees. And if a manager was quite capable, he could start a new factory and get a cut from the old factory plus a cut from the new factory. So everything, the whole thing is driven by a rewarding system. But it was really that a certain size was the optimal size, and that I, uh, I it believe got too very big. strongly. I sometimes had the uh, quality efficiency experts say, "Look, because uh, uh, we we had close to a, uh, we had about four hundred twenty factories, and some of the efficiency experts said, "Look, uh, uh, trim it down, have fewer factories, and then you'd be more efficient.' That that it, that won't be the case." Because, again, it's people, 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 people want to be recognized. They want to be recognized if they do a good job and be rewarded. So I uh, and and managers also, you know, if a manager, if a manager is responsible for one factory, he wants to be recognized. He wants to be, he doesn't want to be thrown in with every other manager. And uh, so it, it will work a lot better. You came in the 1950s with uh, 
just a small amount of money in your pocket. And you were a tool and die expert, I understand. Yeah, I I when I was a, when I was 15 years old, my mother took me by my hand. There was a big factory. Yeah, I grew up in a small town, but there was a big factory there. She knew she knew a foreman there. She went in and said, look to the foreman, I want you to teach that boy a trade. I very little did I know what that means, tool and die making. But for everything, like might it be a spoon, might it be a dash pot, might it be a, it, whatever. You, you need you need tools to make that because nothing is made by hand. So that's a very technical trade. And so anyway, so uh, that's what I learned. And I, I wanted to see the world. And I applied to visas to South Africa, uh, the Australia, the United States, and Canada. And sometimes I'm a little tough on the Canadian bureaucracy, but I still am saying it's the best. They came first forward to the visas. I wound up in Canada with 200 bucks. That didn't last too long. You know, there were times when I was hungry in my early days. Hungry not because I wanted to lose weight. I was hungry and no money to buy food. That leaves a very, very deep impression. And those are maybe the underlying reasons why I see the world a little different, why I say, gee, uh, look, there's a way we can eliminate poverty. Because when you take a look in, in Canada, United States, maybe 50, 60% of the, of the family will live from paycheck to paycheck. You know, the stress mothers go through and say, gee, where's the money coming next week? What food do I have to buy? So we we got we should be more concerned and and to, to, to eliminate poverty. Now, there's no question. Um, how big did you grow Magna? Well, Magna, we uh, when I kind of stepped out in 2015, we were close to 40 billion U.S., and 170,000 employees. 40 billion, 170,000 employees all started from uh, you with a couple a couple dollars in your pocket yeah, in the 1950s. Five, five well, $5,000 in 57, you could buy a small farm, you could buy a small house with it, right? So uh, it's like having maybe three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. But anyway, it wasn't a lot. And I bought a few used machines and out I went hustling. Fascinating story. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back in just sure. two minutes with Frank Stronick uh, and talk a little bit about this uh, this new institute that he's launched and uh, the, the the seven or eight principles that uh, he wants to include in an economic charter of rights. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Well, Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Our guest tonight is Frank Stronick. Who uh, who probably needs no introduction uh, to anyone in uh, in Canada, but uh, is really one of the most impressive business people that I've had the pr privilege of interacting with uh, over my career. Uh, I've met uh, Frank a few times in my career. I actually interviewed with him uh, in the early two thousands uh, when he was uh, looking for someone in finance and spent a fair amount of time with him, um, understanding about Magna and some of the opportunities. and And the company was just uh, unbelievably impressive. Uh, you may remember, sir, that uh, I worked with Eugene Melnick, uh, who was also big in the racehorse business, and we ended up having a couple of conversations about what uh, you and Eugene might be able to do with uh, with racehorses together. And that was an interesting conversation engineered by Dennis Mills at the time, who I think was one of your advisors as well. But uh, last Monday, you were kind enough to introduce me to an institute, a new institute that you're launching. Um, tell us, if you could, the seven principles of this hey. economic Bill of Rights that you want to institute. Okay, so basically, I, I'm I'm kind of worried, right? Uh, uh, like I said early on, I I created about over 400 factories in 34 different countries, and when you we when we are younger, we all hustle a bit to make some money so that we can live in dignity. It, but in essence, I could live in in over thirty countries with dignity, et cetera, et cetera. But I choose Canada. Canada is a great country, so we got to be very careful that we're not defaulting. And I, I, I do have some worries, right? Because uh, the bureaucracy is growing, inflation is growing, and uh, when you look around buildings, any buildings gone up? They are not factories; those are warehouses. 
In a country which imports more and more and exports less and less, the economy will break down, right? So, uh, so I, 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 I think we need some changes, but I, I, you never succeed. You don't get anything done by pointing fingers whose fault it is. But uh, we we gotta we gotta implement a few economic principles, and it does not also solve when you come in with a chainsaw. In essence, I'm saying we need seven principles to get Canada on a healthy economic footing again. One would be we got to eliminate the debt. Our debt is enormous. You know, uh, uh, how how can the younger generation pay that back, right? Just the interest payments alone, uh, about approximately $150 million a day, right? And it's heaping up in a, it's a huge amount of that right that's one problem but the second problem is we gotta reduce uh, our, our bureaucracy is climbing like crazy and again i'm not pointing the fingers to the bureaucrats it's their fault right? in a civilized society uh, every citizen got the right to uh, to find a job whatever the openings are so we it's the system which is at fault but we gotta we should have a freeze we we don't have to fire we don't have to lay off bureaucrats but we could have a freeze let's say for the, that we don't hire any in any new uh, bureaucrats right so in 10 years we i think the bureaucracy will come down about 50 percent and that uh, but that doesn't get us back you know 40 50 years ago right I think the bureaucracy has climbed maybe about to 300%. So in the golden years for business, for what the people did well in Canada, well, it was maybe 40, 50 years ago. So we got to reduce the bureaucracy. So there'll be hiring freeze. The third, the third principle is our tax system is so convoluted. You know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of regulations nobody understands. It's it's so the tax system's got to be black and white. You know, it should be similar. Uh, you know, uh, to, uh, on income, uh, let's say a hundred thousand will be tax free, and for every few thousand you earn more than a hundred thousand, uh, the tax rate will climb. You know, uh, maybe two or three percent, right? Uh, if you start making a million bucks, the, 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 the tax rate would be 50%, right? So if you pay more, you, uh, you, you'd pay more taxes. And you need a consumption tax, right? Uh, as an example, let's say the consumption tax is 20%. If you have a Chevy and it costs $20,000, 20% would be $4,000. But if let's say if you buy uh, a Cadillac and the Cadillac costs a hundred thousand, and the uh, consumption tax rate is twenty percent, you you pay forty thousand, right? So um, so the rich pay more, right? If you buy a house, whatever, if you an expensive bottle of wine, the rich will pay more. So it should be. So we need a simplified tax system, no loopholes and a black and white uh, system. Uh, thirdly, uh, or fourthly, I should say, the point four would be we got to take the red tape off. The, we got to take the chains of small business. There's only two rules would apply. Workplace safety, and you cannot dump poison chemicals in the backyard. So, but otherwise, otherwise, you have a minimum amount of of of, of bureaucracy, and um, and small business will not pay any income tax. They pay a wage tax, and if the owner uh, wants to take some money, he pays the same wage taxes, whatever percentage what workers uh, uh, pay. But but if a small business hire, hires one employee and that pays tax, 
that's more money than the small company will pay. So let's leave the small companies that they don't have to pay, uh, fill out a, a huge amount of forms and, 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 and paperwork. So uh, so let, uh, let those entrepreneurs, let them make 50 million, uh, let them make 100 million. That should be pure free enterprise. So where young people in Canada say, I want to achieve what XXX does, right? So we, we if we don't do that, uh, society cannot function. The problem uh, with socialistic, communistic uh, ideas is those ideas are based on wealth distribution. First, you got to create the wealth. Otherwise, there's nothing to distribute. And small companies will be the ideal companies. Let them, let them, let them operate. But when the, the small companies get larger, over three hundred people, then they got to pay a portion of their profits to the employees. So that's the fifth. You know, uh, the fifth is where larger companies uh, have to pay to their employees a portion of the profits. The sixth uh, principle would be. High school should be stopped at uh, grade 10. Grade 11 and grade 12, our kids should learn uh, what uh, what trades are all about. And I think this would be a win-win-win for young people. They could find out what they what they enjoy, what where they could be good in it. And uh, that doesn't mean they couldn't go to university two, three years, or a few years later, right? But if they would learn a trade, then we start, Canada, we could start making products again, and that's I think that's crucial. And the the seventh principle is no Canadian kid should go to school hungry. That means breakfast got to be served. No Canadian kid should leave the school hungry. That means lunch has got to be served. And below, this would have to be organic. So those are the seven principles. Nothing to do with politics purely economic and we could get we could get um, Canada back on a, on a, on a sound uh, uh, economic foundation and most of all if we if, if workers get can participate in profits I think we could create an environment where we could eliminate poverty I think that's the very key if you eliminate poverty eliminate hate you eliminate just about everything. One of the reasons why you've launched this uh, this institute and uh, the seven um, the seven economic freedoms, you say, is because you think there's a growing divide between rich and poor, rich and the working class, with more and more money being uh, held by and made by fewer and fewer people. It's a huge growing divide. I, I think about two percent in the states. At uh, I think there's more that in the states than in Canada. Two uh, percent of uh, of people, and you know, they hold about sixty percent of the assets. In the Canada, it's maybe when that's grown. So the divide between uh, between the rich and the working poor is growing, right? So we we gotta uh, it, it it can't work that way. So the the very I've, I've always said the world has always been dominated by the golden rule and still is. I don't want to be dominated by anyone. If I feel that strong, I should not be able to dominate somebody either. Really, the question is how can we dismantle the chains of dominations? Not via violent revolutions, only via revolutions of the mind. We need new ideas. And I bring forward new ideas. I hopefully other people bring forward new ideas. But I think it's a very simple formula, you know, and I've always said if the economy doesn't work, nothingness will work. We cannot so, feed the hungry. We cannot look after the most fragile people, the elderly, the sick, and the handicapped. But we got to keep talking what drives the economy. The so economy, let me, I repeat what I said early on, the, the economy is driven by three forces, smart managers, hardworking employees, and investors. All three have a right to the outcome, which is profits. So again, uh, the message I want to get across, we need an economic chart of rights where those rules are laid down. And we need, we got to make capitalists out of the workers. Okay. Ca uh, workers also should have the right to accumulate capital. Okay. And not live from paycheck to paycheck every week. 
So it's a very simple, it's a very simple model. And but most of all, I've proven it with Magna, right? To to build the company from scratch to 170,000 employees, because we had uh, formulas and rules built on profit sharing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I I, I think uh, there's a role model which uh, I can Magna I guess has been the most successful company in the world. Let me go through your seven points again, if I could, and uh, ask you a few questions. So number one is balance the budget and eliminate the national debt. We had a similar situation back in the 1990s uh, where our debt got to uh, unsustainable levels. Uh, our debt uh, and deficit right now is is at um, you know levels that we haven't seen since uh, the 1990s. And what it took at the time was a very concentrated effort to uh, reduce um, public spending. And uh, as as you probably know better than I, Paul Martin, the finance minister at the time, reduced public spending by 20%. I think it was in 1995. In 1994, he tried and started the process, but in 1995, they got very serious. And, and five years later, we actually had a surplus uh, in our budget deficit. But it took a real attitudinal change, both within the, the public as well as within government, to institute that kind of very drastic and very dramatic uh, reduction in public spending. Do you think we can do that again today, a 20% reduction in public well, spending? Well, I think we're so far gone up the road, right? It's enormous, right? But uh, that's what the economic chart of rights gives workers some rights and puts a discipline on the politicians, right? Because they would not be allowed to create the, They must have a balanced budget. It's, it's a must. You know, like every housewife knows... She cannot spend more monies than what her husband brings in, or or if the husband is at home and the, well, whatever. The, uh, uh, a, a small household, they know they cannot spend more than what monies they have, otherwise they wind up in a poor house. Every farmer knows he cannot spend more monies than what he gets for his crop. The only people which do not know is the politicians. They want to be reelected and they promise and promise and, and hand out monies and the inflation climbs and the debt climbs. And what do we leave behind to our young kids? But we got to turn it around. We, we got to imply some, some sound principles. Your second point is reduce government regulations and overhead. OECD says that we are the most regulated economy in the G7 and that approvals for whether it be housing or uh, natural resource development, et cetera, take longer in Canada than anywhere else in uh, in the G7. Is that sustainable? Yes, of course. No, you, you won't be. Uh, look, the same thing. I could work in the factory and I can tell uh, if that factory makes money or not. If there's too many office people, uh, that factory, uh, that, that company cannot be successful. It doesn't matter how hard the workers work on the factory floor. If there's too many people in the offices, they they won't make any money and, and they go broke down the road. The same holds true with the country. A country where the where the, the overhead, the bureaucracy is too high, will not be. They will go broke. Government employment has increased by something like 40% in the last several years. So there's a lot more civil servants that are... Uh that are regulating us uh, today than there were in the past. There's just no question. Well, the increase is enormous. So we, we cannot sustain that. Your third point is about the tax system. Um, we have uh, in Canada, one of only three countries in the, uh, in the, in the G7, uh, along with, um, along with uh, uh, France, I think it's Italy, uh, where the top marginal tax rate is above 50%, 53%, I think it is. Um, and uh, and yet we are also the country where it kicks in at the lowest level of income, somewhere around $200,000, while in uh, France, it kicks in at about a million dollars. Uh, so you talk about simplifying our tax system, but are the tax rates also a problem? Well, we got to simplify the tax system. Look, when I ran Magna, you know, I had on one hand had about 20 lawyers, to my left side and to my right hand at about 20 tax specialists. First, if I wanted to do X, 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 I went to the lawyers and say, is this legal, right? When they said, that's yeah, okay. Then I went to the financial people and said, look, how does that, uh, how would the tax treatment be if I do X, X, X? They studied it for a week and say, well, we can't tell. It could be either way, but they're specialists down, down. 
So uh, the specialist in down down they looked at it. He got a uh, he got a big bill, and after two uh, after two weeks he got a big bill, and they say it could be either or. Okay, and that's the the whole tax system is that way. Okay, it's it's it um, it's um, it, it gives um, I think it gives uh, uh, special treatments to the very rich. Your number four is kickstart the Canadian economy by enhancing free enterprise, and and you suggest doing this through eliminating the business tax for for small uh, uh, small companies. Another critique that many people have made is that the tax on capital gains um, and the disincentives to corporations uh, investing in Canada are is very high, such that uh, we've got one of the lowest amounts of business investments in uh, in in, uh, in in the G7 in Canada. Uh, why don't businesses invest more in R and D in building factories? Well, business is like uh, flows to. Uh where business get the greatest return, right? And if uh, the tax is that, uh, that high, then and the return is then uh, you know the the money won't stay; it will flow to a different uh, flows to a different uh, different areas. So we we uh, look if you make more money, so you got to pay more tax. But uh, the very thing is, uh, small business are the key. Uh, you know, uh, it, it, you know, there's, 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 there's close to a million small businesses in Canada. Imagine if they just, if each business would hire one employ, uh, one employee, that would be a million, uh, a million employees more. But uh, Canada could uh, could use um, uh, a few hundred magnets, right? Sure could, and uh, and that that could be easily done. It's small business. We got to focus on it. Number and six, get the red tape, get the chains of small business. Number six is reform our educational system. Number seven is uh, teach our children about nutrition and provide organic food. Sir, you're in your nineties. I uh, had the pleasure of eating at your restaurant, which serves only organic food. What's the secret to your longevity and your vibrancy in your 90s? Well, I've been always reasonably moderations. I didn't smoke. Well, as a kid, I, I you know, you, we all try a little bit, but I never smoked. I've never really, yes, uh, if I have a meal, it might be lunch, and then I, I have a, maybe half a glass or a glass. Uh, fine, uh, nearly every day, but I can honestly say I've never been drunk. But most of all, I, I do try to look as a kid. I was, I, I had cornmeal three times a day, seven days a week, because I come from a rare, very poor uh, working class family. But the corn was organic because it, in those days they had no chemicals. So I grew up maybe healthy. And uh, for the last 10 years, I tried to focus to eat uh, very healthy, to eat organic uh, organic food. I decided about 10, 12 years ago to go into the farming. And the more I got into it, the more I could see this huge chemical jungle. You know, uh, I, I would say about 95% of all the foods eaten in the world comes from industrial farms. In industrial farms, you see no more eagles fly Why? There is no more, you know, uh, there's no more rabbits. There's no more pheasants. We kill everything. All the all the, the pesticides, fungicides gets in the air. We breathe the air, gets in the water. We drink the water. And most of all, it gets into the soil. It gets into the food. So when you take a look, practically all the kids have allergies and stage two diabetics is normally on the rise. If people would know the amount of chemicals they eat, you know, uh, it, it's it's uh, it's it's unrealistic. But we gotta be. Uh, I, I think families, uh, we as a country, gotta see what is it what we most stress on. We gotta see that we don't poison our kids. We gotta see do our kids have the best chance to grow up healthy, and the best chance they have is. If if they don't eat chemicals, and that's why I'm saying it's so important that our kids eat organic foods. And anybody saying we can afford that, that's a very, that's not an intelligent statement because the costs, 
that the medical cost uh, in the billions and billions and billions. So I hope every kid should have the same chance. Uh, the the richer families, uh, you know, uh, they try to they try to eat organic and their kids organic, but every kid, it doesn't matter what race, what um, standard they have, every kid should have the chance to eat organic food and have a chance to grow up healthy. Because if you don't grow up healthy. Uh, you won't be happy. It will hamper your learning activities, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think first and foremost, we really should make an effort. What do we have to do that our kids grow up healthy and happy? Well, I couldn't agree more. And I got to tell you, the meal that you uh, that you uh, prepared for us at uh, Frank's, I think it's called Frank's Restaurant and Marketplace in Aurora, um, with uh, kale Caesar salad and uh, goulash and then apple strudel all from organic uh, food, was just excellent. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back with Frank Stronach. And I'm going to ask him about the car industry in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's a real pleasure and honor of mine to be chatting tonight with a hero uh, that I've had uh, within the Canadian business community, Frank Stronach of uh, Magna. And uh, he's just a... you know, one of the most impressive uh, gentlemen um, in his 90s on Monday night, he stood up for probably an hour and uh, and in front of a group of about 60 people told us about his economic charter of rights and his brand new foundation, uh, the Astronic Foundation that he had launched. Uh, I also had the opportunity then, sir, to ask you about the future of the car industry. Given your your leading role in the Canadian automotive parts industry, you must study the car industry in great detail. What do you think is the future of the car industry. Are we all going to be driving electrical autonomous cars in the future, or is there still a role for, uh, for we gas cars? Go to, we got to go back to horse and buggies, <laughs> but, uh, you yeah, know, electric cars will play a role, but, uh, the problem is the grid system is the grid system isn't there. So, uh, and that would take many years to do. So, a lot of large uh, the 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 car companies which make large electric cars will be losing a lot of monies because the competition be fierce, and most of all, uh, people might not be able to drive them because the grid system isn't there. So anyway, at the time I I got into it. Uh, uh because um there's a number of reasons right uh, i had to go down down a few times uh, the last two years what used to take me half an hour from the outer ring uh, from the 401 to the center of the city now if everything is fine it takes an hour but it could take two hours so it's not only the the waiting time that traffic jams, the inhaling of the, the greenhouse gases. It's just, uh, and um, what a waste of uh, human energy, energy, non-renewable energy. So uh, I don't think you have to be a great scientist to know that we're going to be running out of gas sooner than later. I would say in about two, three years, gasoline will triple. I would say in eight years, gasoline will be rationalized will only be available for essential purposes. So the very key is how do we going to get around, right? I think small electric vehicles, it's unavoidable. You know, that'd be the, the future. Small electrical vehicles. will move. Sir, you've been involved in Canadian politics. You ran for parliament at one point in time. You've been involved in um, Austrian politics, uh, your birthplace. Um, and you're now launching a uh, foundation. You've been involved... Uh, from a policy standpoint, uh, even when you weren't running for politics. Why the significant interest in policy and politics? Well, not politics, but uh, look, I have a conscience. I've been blessed with a good mind and good health, and my conscience tells me, uh, you know, when you take a look uh, in history, when you look back in history, all countries have basically vice councils where people had uh, uh, consulted people which done well for the country, et cetera. That's missing now, right? And so I'm saying, uh, gee, I I have accumulated so much uh, knowledge, right? Uh, And that should not be lost over to to for Canadians. And, you know, as a kid, uh, we, Austria was occupied by Nazi Germany, right? With the Nazi regime. 
in hindsight, when I look back, I ask myself, how can that happen? And then we were occupied by the Russians. We had the communistic regime for a while. And, and, and again, it's not, uh, those systems don't work, right? And the socialistic system don't work. Uh, they are based on wealth creation, on, on, on wealth distribution. First, you got to create the wealth. Otherwise, there's nothing to distribute. So we do have some problems. And I, I, you know, uh, I, I do say uh, it doesn't matter how smart you are. Uh, if the stars are not aligned, it won't work. So life's been great to me. I've been blessed that I that I could uh, provide some guidelines and uh, and uh, I, I hope to teach in universities. Uh, it's um, very you know I've. In the years before, I, I gave lectures in Harvard, right across the States, right across Canada, right across Europe. But it only occurred to me the last few years, you know, uh, what is the mandate of a university? The mandate of a university is to teach young people how can we create a more civilized society. In essence, university would be the ideal institutions where we got to search what would be the structure of an ideal society. I think it's right there where we, if we look, if we, if, if we haven't got a concept after for, you know, then it's something, there's something wrong with us. <laughs> We should we should arrive on a on a concept. What would be the structure of an ideal society? I, I, so I think this is where we got to be working on it, and uh, and uh, and I think it's important that society, that the universities are there for auditoriums. They can invite very successful people. Might have been in sports and the arts and medicine. You know, it's very because a society needs all those inputs. But again, the key fact is, if the economy doesn't work, nothing else will work. Sir, I thank you for your uh, your your seven points in your um, economic uh, charter of rights. Uh, we've got, as we've talked about, high debt, high interest rates, high tax rates, low productivity, uh, inflation. Are you optimistic for Canada? Or are you pessimistic? I do. Uh, it, look, if you lose hope, is the most important thing. With, without hope, uh, you, you got to. So I want to spread that. I, I see, uh, hopefully, uh, grassroots uh, movement. And uh, you got to, you know, sometimes if we, if things are very well, we, we let the days go by without really. But, uh, uh, but um, now I think um, the fridge is going to get sort of somewhat empty, you know, in most households. And this is the time when you got to reflect. This is the time when people could be made aware of, look, that we got to change the system. And that change that you're looking for is this economic charter of rights. Anything else? The economic charter, look, it's so obvious that workers have a right to some of the profits. It, it's, you know, because without workers, you couldn't, you know, you could before if you have a whip or whatever, right? But we, we don't want to have a society like that. But we have a society which hasn't, we have a society of bosses and workers. Well, that's probably the biggest change that you put in place uh, in our. Uh, yeah, in I want to. I, I want to have partners as the workers. I don't want to be a boss. I think. Uh, I think every day. I think for me the most important thing was how. What do you have to do that the workers respect me? I think every day I I, I ask myself the same question. Well, you created Magna with a hundred and seventy thousand jobs and one billion. Uh, more than, and you shared more than one billion dollars. You shared more than one billion dollars with your workers over time, and you contributed billions of dollars uh, to the Canadian economy. Uh, you've contributed to politics. You've contributed to philanthropy. You've contributed to horse racing, um, and uh, you're now contributing with this economic charter of rights. And if you're interested uh, in uh, in the Stronic Foundation and the economic charter of rights, you can go to economiccharter.ca for more information about this foundation. Frank Stronic. Thank you for the uh, the privilege of interviewing you, sir, and thank you again for the invitation to dinner on Monday night.
Brian, great had a chance to talk with you, and it takes people like you with, to broadcast and, and try to get some ideas, uh, broaden them so people will pick up and and think, well, let's do something about it. Okay, thanks, Brian. We got to do it again. I look forward to it, sir. Okay, We're going to take a break uh, and come back in just two minutes with some of my concluding comments. Mr. Stronick, it's a pleasure, okay. sir. Okay, thank you.